We left off the other day, <clears throat> and we had just finished talking about when Hamlet and Laertes jump into Ophelia's grave, and Hamlet says, at the very end of scene one, two, Laertes, you know, I loved you ever, indicating, you know, they'd been friends for a long time. Claudius tells Horatio, take Hamlet away, calm him down. Okay, so Horatio does. And we pick up with scene two, somewhere in the castle, we're told it's a hall in the castle, and Hamlet and Horatio are apparently walking. Okay. Um, and Hamlet tells Horatio early on in that scene, uh, beginning 10, 9, 8. Uh, let's begin with line 6. Okay. Hamlet says rashly, and you've got a gloss down there, that is, rashly goes with line 12. 10, 11. Can't go with line 12. Line 12 is that is most certain. That makes no sense. Rashly, and praise be rashness for it, let us know our indiscretion sometimes serves us well when our deep plots do pall. Deep plots do pall. Pall there means fail. Right? What deep plots is he talking about? Or let me put it this way. What deep plots has Hamlet had that have so far failed? It's another word for plot. A plan, some kind of course of action. What's been his course of action, supposedly at least, ever since seeing the ghost? Two words, kill Claudius. Has he killed Claudius yet? No, he hasn't. Why? That's the deep plots that he's talking about. Our indiscretion, okay, rashly and praise be rashness for it, let us know. Our indiscretion sometimes serve us, serves us well when our deep plots do pall. Our indiscretion, he says, is beneficial when our plots fail. Well, what's he then mean by indiscretion? Our unthought out act, our unplanned he says, sometimes is beneficial. It helps us do what our plots fail to do. Okay? And then he goes on. And that should learn, learn there means teach. And that should teach us. There's a divinity that shapes our ends. Rough hew them how we will. Okay? So, it shapes our Ends, and that's a very important word. Rough hew them how we will. Okay, the language he's using is the language of woodworking. Okay, shaping, hewing. When you hew something like timber, you, you cut a tree down and you use an axe, let's say to shape that timber from the round tree into essentially a square, a long square, okay? So Hamlet says, we do what? We, we rough hew, what's the them? Our ends. We rough hew our ends as we will. What's our ends? end of our life, the purpose of our existence, yeah, it's both of those. Our, let's use the word he uses, our plots. You know, every plot has a point for every, every play. Every play has a point it is trying to make, okay? That's the end. That's the purpose. So Hamlet says two things are involved with the purpose of human existence, right? One of those, or excuse me, two things are involved in the completion of that. 
One of those is our rough hewing. How do we rough hew our purpose? Decisions we make, actions we take, things like that. Okay? But he says something else is involved too. Divinity. God. God shapes our ends, rough hew them as we will. So we take our ends to be a piece of wood. We sit there with a broad edge and we shape it. We get the bark off. We try to get it straight. But he says our doing that works in tandem with this. The shaping is giving fine form to it. It's taking fine shapings. It's turning that rough log that we've rough hewn maybe into a sculpture, maybe into a carving. So he says, we down here on the human plane, we go about our lives, we do our things, we think our thoughts, etc. Meanwhile, God up here is acting simultaneously with us. The word that's used in the early church fathers is that God and humanity work in synergy. Synergy is a, a, a buzzword today, used in business you know, language. What's it mean? The sin there means with or together. The urgy energy, okay? Working, in other words, hand in glove. Only difference is, let's say this is the hand. The hand is unaware that there's a glove. The hand is unaware. What's going on down here is unaware of what's going on up there. Okay? So there's a divinity that shapes our ends, rough hew them how we will. What's his real point by that? I'm not in total control of what is going on. Hamlet seems to be coming to this idea. I couldn't have killed Claudius in Act 3. Why? Because the divinity is shaping me. It wasn't the right time. Okay? So they continue talking. In Hamlet explains what happened to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. And Horatio says, line 56, so Guildenstern and Rosencrantz go to it. What's the it? Their death. They went to their death? Hamlet. Why, man, they did make love to this employment. They wanted this job. That is, Hamlet is saying, they wanted to escort me to England so that I would be killed. That's why he says, I don't feel any guilt for what happened to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. He's essentially saying this about them. They did what? They made their bed. They chose their actions. Okay? So they keep talking. And Hamlet explain, you know, goes on about what kind of person Claudius is in response to Horatio's line 62. Why, what a king is this? Because it's it's after, you know, Horatio says, so Rosencrantz and Guildenstern go to it. The Hamlet explains exactly what Rosencrantz and Guildenstern were doing. They were taking him to their death. That's when Horatio says, man, what a king is Claudius. Like, how low can you be? And so Hamlet says, does it not think thee, that put yourself in my shoes, does it not stand me now? He that hath killed my king, my father, whored my mother, popped in between the election and my hopes, thrown out his angle for my proper life, that is, baited me to death, and with such cousinage, is it not perfect conscience to quit him with this arm? That is, am I not in my right mind and am I not morally right to quit him, kill him with this arm? Why? Because he's just listed all of Claudius' sins. Now, Hamlet has already said that... I might be thinking my other class where I already pointed out where he says this. Yeah. 
Yes, I think he's already said, Act 3. That he's the scourge from heaven. Okay? Scourge. That is, he's like a plague brought on Claudius to end Claudius. All right? So, notice one of the things he said there, by the way. He said that Claudius popped in between the election and my hopes. The election of what? Germanic society. Okay. And I pointed this out before. Typically, in pure monarchical societies um, that follow what's called the law of primogeniture, King dies. If the king has an eldest son, the eldest son becomes king. Germanic society had a little wrinkle on that. And we see this in the old Anglo-Saxon society. Right? And we see it in some of the German societies up until the time Shakespeare was writing. Okay? And, and here's the wrinkle. You have a system of electors, all right? So for example, in the Anglo-Saxon society, that is the society what we today call England from roughly 500 to 1100. If a king died and the king had a son, the son didn't automatically become king. The electors, which is the king's council of advisors would say, you are king. That is, they have to give assent to it. They have to agree to it. That's what Claudius is alluding to. It's one of the things Claudius is alluding to in that long opening speech of his. When he says, you know, my brother died, and we went to his funeral, and we mixed funeral sorrow with happiness, how I'm marrying my dead brother's wife, and we thank you for what? Agreeing to it. So you agreed that I could become his wife, and you agreed I could become king. That's what Hamlet's referring to about he popped in between the election and my hopes. Hamlet said, when my father died, I should have been elected king. This is why it's going to be important. With Hamlet's dying breath, he gives his electoral vote to somebody. Okay? And he's going to tell us who should be the next king of Denmark. All right? So, they keep talking. And Horatio says, top of 1692, you know Claudius is going to find out pretty soon what happened. I mean, he's going to find out what happened to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Word's going to come back from England. You know, I've done what you asked me to do. I killed the two bearers of the, of the message. He's going to be upset. Okay? Hamlet, it'll be short. That is, the time will be short. What he means is time's running out. The interim is mine. The interim, the time between now and when time runs out. Remember, Tam Hamlet said, time is out of joint. Oh, alas, hateful spite that I was born to make it right. Okay? As time's running out, Hamlet's saying, it's my time now to act. It's my time to make time right, to put it back in joint. And a man's life's no more than to say one. So what does that mean? A man's life's no more than to say one. He's talking about how brief our existence is. How long does it take to say one? In the grand scheme of things, the psalmist, Old Testament Psalms, says, you know, we are allotted three score and ten, 70 years. And if we're lucky, 80 years. Okay. Out of how many years have there been? 
Okay? There have been a lot. And man's life, no more to say than to say one. But I'm sorry, Horatio, for two liturgies I forgot myself. Notice, Hamlet's apologizing. I, I mistreated liturgies. I shouldn't have treated him the way I did. And he's kind of telling us, and I need to make it right with him, right? The two liturgies I forgot myself, for by the image of my cause, I see the portraiture of his. The image of my cause, what's the image of Hamlet's cause? His dead father. And he says, as my dead father spurs me to revenge, I understand Laertes. He's got cause. I understand why he wants to kill me. I'll court his favors. That's fancy language for I'll seek his forgiveness. Okay? Be sure the bravery of his grief did put me into a towering passion. And that is, see, Laertes' grief over his sister's death put Hamlet into a towering passion. Towering, uncontrollable, upwelling. All right? So in comes a character named Osric. who's a courtier, okay? And Osric's there for one purpose only. It's to tell Hamlet that Laertes is challenging you to a duel. It's not a duel to the death. It's not that kind of a duel. It's simply a fencing match, a sporting match, okay? And the king bets on you, Hamlet. The king thinks you're going to win. So he's there to essentially find out, do you accept the challenge? Will you engage in this sporting match? Okay. Hamlet says, sure, yeah, I'll do it. Okay. Bottom of 1694. Another lord comes in and he says, um, you know, the queen wants you to use some gentle entertainment to Laertes before you fall to play. That is, the king wants you to make up to Laertes. Hamlet says, okay, I will. And then Horatio, very bottom of page 1694, line 183, I think. You're going to lose this wager, my lord. Laertes is going to win. Is that really what you want your best friend to say to you as you're getting ready for a, a big match? You're going to lose? No. And notice Hamlet disagrees. No, I don't think so. Since he went into France, that is, since the beginning of the play, we don't know how many days have gone by. All right? Since the beginning of the play, I've been in continual practice. That is, every day. I've been practicing my fencing. I shall win at the odds. He doesn't mean I'm going to win outright. He means when we get ready to start this, the betters, so to speak, are going to do an odds system. They're going to say the odds are Laertes will win, but we'll give, you know, kind of these odds, five to one. And Hamlet's saying, I'm going to win on the basis of the odds. If he only wins by four to one, Hamlet wins. Okay. But thou wouldst not think how all's here about my heart. But thou wouldst not think how ill all is here about my heart. Hamlet saying, I got a funny feeling about this. Something around my heart tells me something's wrong. Nay, good, my lord. It's but a foolery. It's such a kind of gain-giving as would perhaps trouble a woman. Gain-giving, a misgiving. What's Hamlet saying? It's the kind of thing that a woman would go, oh, you shouldn't do this. Oh, you shouldn't. Right? Within Shakespeare, there's a lot of examples of those kinds of women. They usually turn out to be right. Okay? For example, Julius Caesar played Dunnan. 1599, you have Julius Caesar's wife, Calpurnia, tell Caesar, 
don't go out. Tomorrow, the Ides of March, because the soothsayer said, beware the Ides of March, and she's had bad dreams. And Caesar's like, you're a woman. They're bad dreams. Who cares? Okay? I, I kind of think, because Shakespeare does that in several plays, I kind of think Shakespeare's one of those very wise men who says, husbands, listen to your wives. <laughs> they tend to be more perceptive because we, we tend to be dumb, you know. So, Horatio, if your mind, okay, Hamlet said it was a trouble around his heart. Horatio, if your mind dislike anything, obey it. If your mind, if your reason tells you don't do this, don't do it. I'll give it, I'll tell him some excuse. I'll tell him you're ill. Hamlet. And in one sense, I think this is the thematic center of the entire play. And by that, I think in one sense, this is what Shakespeare wants us to see is the meaning, the ultimate theme of Hamlet. Okay, I could be wrong. There are lots of themes in Hamlet. There might be other things more important than this. Hamlet, not a wit. In other words, no way. You're not going to tell him I'm sick. Why? We defy augury. What's augury? Fortune telling. Okay? Or future telling. Augury was a practice, you know, for example, of, they didn't do it in Shakespeare's day, but they did it in classical days, of, you know, slitting a pigeon, spilling its guts out, and seeing how they land. You'll see this when we do Sophocles things. And going, oh, look, oh, my God, what is that? That means, you know, oh, look, the line on your hand isn't long. You're going to die sooner. That's augury. So we defy augury. There's a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. Matthew. Matthew chapter 10, verses 29 to 31, or Luke chapter 12, verses 6 through 7. Okay? 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will? Your father's will, God's will, is God's providence, God's shaping of everything that happens, okay? But he doesn't stop there. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So, God's aware when even a sparrow falls. You're of much more value than a sparrow. There's a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. What's Hamlet's point? God is in control. That's what's meant by providence. God is in control of everything. If he's aware when a stupid little bird falls out of a tree, then he's aware of what happens to me. And then look at what he says. If it be not now, tis not to come. Excuse me. If it be now, tis not to come. If it be not to come, it will be now. If it be not now, yet it will come. The readiness is all. Hamlet never, in that little speech, gives the noun to which it refers. It's a pronoun. Pronoun, the pro means in place of. It's a noun in place of another noun. It refers to. But Shakespeare never explains what the it is. What is it? Death. It's death. Read it this way. If death be now, death is not to come. If death be not to come, death will be now. If death be not now, yet death will come. The readiness is all. 
What's the rating this is on? Whether it's right now, two seconds around, I have a massive heart attack and die in front of you. Or five minutes from now, and somebody comes in from out there who's got a bad grade and shoots up a classroom. Or five years from now, or in your case, it's 50 years from now. He says, if death comes now, guess what? It won't come later. But if death doesn't come now, it will come later. The readiness is all. We have to be ready when? Now? Tomorrow? All times. We have to be ready to die. Okay? The readiness is all. Since no man of ought he leaves knows. That is, no man knows anything about when he leaves. None of us know when we're going to die. Even if you get a quote-unquote terminal diagnosis, you go to the doctor, you find out this cough you've had, it's, you know, lung cancer. You've got three weeks. You don't know that that's an exact three weeks. It might be four weeks. <laughs> It might be one week. And as it's happened with lots, lots of folks, it might be four years. Oops, diagnosis was a little wrong there. Okay? Since no man of Aki leaves knows, what is it to leave betimes? Okay? Let be. Don't worry about it, Horatio. If this is my time to go, I'll die. If it's not my time to die, I won't die. Just let it roll. Let's see what happens. Okay? So, a table is brought in, trumpets, a bunch of people come in. The king says, Come, Hamlet, take this hand from me. And he puts Laertes' hand into Hamlet's hand. Why? He's essentially saying, be friends, make up. Okay? He's also saying, what do boxers do before they fight? They go up and they touch fists. Why? Well, it's a sign of respect, personally. But it's also... You know, this is nothing personal. This, this, I don't hate you. It's, it's why one thing, you know, I don't watch a lot of sports. I used to play soccer, so I've taken the last few weeks to watching Premier League soccer on, on my computer. And one of the things I like about, you know, English and, and European football, soccer, is all those players know each other. And they don't know each other because they've been on X team, Y team forever. It's because they're on X team, and yet they're also on a national team. That is, one player's on this team, one player's on this team, and yet because they're both Portuguese, they play for the Portuguese national team or something like that. And so you see some guy just flagrantly trip another player. And then he goes out and picks him up, packs him on the back, you know, and they're joking. You'll see strikers, you know, standing next to goalkeepers trying to edge, edge into them as they're getting ready for a corner kick, and they'll be talking. It's a game. It's not a blood sport, okay? So I think the king's kind of saying, you guys, you know, get along here. Look at what Hamlet does. Give me your pardon, sir. So as he's still, I think, shaking Hora uh, Laertes' hand, he says, give me your pardon. That is, forgive me. I have done you wrong. So he asks for forgiveness, and at the same time, he does what? He apologizes. But pardon it, as you are a gentleman. That is, you are a gentleman, and you should pardon me. Okay? So what's the wrong he's done? And he says, this presence, that is, everybody in this room knows. And you must needs have heard. That is, you might not know but maybe you've heard, but I'm going to tell you now. 
how I am punished with a sore distraction. What's he mean by the distraction? Something in his mind. Earlier when he spoke with the, with the ghost, he talked about this distracted globe. Distracted, the tracted part, it's related to the word tractor. Well, what's a tractor do? It drags things. Whether it's a plow, whether it's a seating implement, etc. So it's dis away, drag. His mind is dragged away from what it ought to be focused on. So he tells him, I'm punished with a sore distraction. What I have done that might your nature honor and accept your roughly awake, I hear proclaim was madness. What I've done, and he kind of says this euphemistically, what is it he's done that Laertes's honor and exception roughly awake? Exception, disapproval. Well, he killed his father. Notice, he doesn't say, I killed your father. He just says, what I have done. All right? I didn't do it. My madness did it. My distraction is what I have done. It's the first time in human history that insanity is used as a self-defense plea. Or excuse me, insanity is used as a plea against murder. Was it Hamlet wronged Laertes? Never Hamlet. And what he means by that is, Laertes, you should know. I would never do anything to hurt you. I would never do anything to hurt you. What did he say earlier? I ever loved you. So, never Hamlet. If Hamlet from himself be taken away, and when he's not himself does wrong, Laertes, then Hamlet does it not. Hamlet denies it. Who does it then? And I think he asks who does it then, because Laertes is going to look at him like, come on, buddy. I mean, really. It's madness. If it be so, Hamlet is of the faction that is wrong. That is, he's saying, Laertes, I'm standing over here with you. Because you were wronged by my madness. And I was wronged by my madness. So my, it's like his madness is over here, and Hamlet's here. And he's saying, it's my madness that killed your father. Why? I never would have killed your father. I'm going to go way out on the limb here. It's pretty clear from the play. It's exceptionally clear from the play. Hamlet loved Ophelia. Hamlet was good friends, let's say, or on very friendly terms with, Polo with um, Laertes. Now, if Hamlet really loved Ophelia and was on very friendly terms with Laertes, how likely is it that Hamlet hated Polonius and wanted to kill him? No. No. He did warn him, <laughs> play the fool in your own house. Let's stay out of my business. So, Hamlet is of the faction that is wrong. His madness is poor Hamlet's enemy. In this audience, let my disclaiming from a purposed evil free me so far in your most generous thoughts that I've shot mine arrow over the house and hurt my brother. He's saying, you're my brother. Okay? I... I never intended to harm you. Laertes, I'm satisfied in nature. That is your gloss. Personally, I'm satisfied. But, <laughs> the gloss tells you, his honor must still be satisfied. And what did we hear about honor? Hamlet says, in that speech, as he's making his way to the ship, when honor's at stake, what must you do? You must find great argument, great quarrel in a straw. That's what 
know, honors at stake here for Laertes. So, whose motive in this case should stir me most to my revenge, that is, I should kill you. But in my terms of honor, I stand aloof, I will no reconcilement, that is, I desire no reconcilement, that is, till by some elder masters of known honor, I have a voice and precedent of peace. In other words, this needs to be heard, like by a court. I'm, I'm not going to seek my revenge, right? But I need some kind of authoritative pronouncement. Did Hamlet do this? Is he guilty of first-degree murder? Or, as Hamlet suggests, is he not guilty by reason of insanity? Because notice, Hamlet says, I was insane. But he's not insane now. Because he can say, I was insane. All right? So, Hamlet says, thank you. They embrace each other. Hamlet says, I'll be your foil, Laertes. In my ignorance, your skill shall like a star. So, I'll be your foil. Shakespeare's punning there on the word for the instrument they're using in the fencing match. And it's a literary term. Okay? A foil, in dramatic terms, <coughs> is a character who is designed to bring out the positive attributes of another character. Okay? It's an opposing character whose characteristics, whose attributes, make somebody else shine. And Hamlet's saying, I'll make you look good, Laertes. Well, what did Horatio say before this even began? You're going to lose. Hamlet, no, 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 I can practice it. His mother says, he's fat. And out of breath. Okay. There's a reason for that. How old is Hamlet? He's 30. Laertes isn't 30. Laertes is probably early 20s. Horatio, I think, is probably early 20s. Okay? So, that's why Laertes says, says, you mock me. No, no, no. Seriously. Okay? So they're given foils. All right? They prepare to play. And the king says, here, let's put these cups of wine. This one, Hamlet's for you. And he mixes the poison in. Okay. They fight. Excuse me. They play. Hamlet says, one, meaning, I got you. Laertes did not. Hamlet begs for judgment. Osric, the guy who invited him to the match, says, a hit, a very palpable hit. That is, Hamlet gets a score. Right? In fencing, you only get a point if the tip touches the other person within a certain part of the body. Right? You can't slap them with the edge of the foil. That doesn't count as a hit. All right? So, Hamlet gets a point. You win with three points. All right? A hit, very palpable hit. There's drums, trumpets, etc. You know. So Laertes says again, King said, no, 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 stop. Hamlet, take a drink. Hamlet's like, no, I'm not thirsty yet. Okay. Laertes, a touch. Because Hamlet says, oh, I got you again. Notice, he only needs one more to win the match. Okay. And the catch when the king says, our son shall win. The queen, he's fat and scant of breath. Scant of breath means Hamlet's already panting. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried fencing. It's hard. I had a, a student 25 years ago in one of my courses, and he did fight choreography. He is a trained fencer, a uh, trained sword fighter, and he started up a little business in town. He no longer has it. But he started a, you know, a sword fighting class. And my kids, when my eldest son and my daughter were pretty young, I mean like 10 and 12 or something like that, they said, oh, we want to do it. And I said, okay, I'll go too. And I did like the first night. An hour, and I would, you know, that was in pretty good shape. And I was dragging; it was so difficult. Anyways, so Hamlet's out of breath, and the Queen says, "I carouse to you, Hamlet." And she takes the wine and drinks it. And the King's like, "No, no, no, not that one." Okay, they play again. 
And we're told, 273 or so, Laertes says, have at you now. Laertes wounds Hamlet, then in scuffling, they change rapiers, and Hamlet wounds Laertes. Notice, Laertes wounds Hamlet. Hamlet doesn't wound Laertes with the first two points. Why not? His rapier is baited. That is, it has a tip on the end, on its sharp point. Laertes, just before they begin, takes the tip off of his. Okay? And he's dipped it in the poison. So, when he stabs Hamlet, he's not, Hamlet doesn't die from the stab wound. That is, the wound doesn't, the stab, the rapier, doesn't pierce his heart or pierce his lungs. It's really just enough to draw blood, okay? But it's tipped with poison, and the poison starts to spread. They fight and scuffle. Hamlet takes his Laertes rapier and pierces Laertes. So now Laertes starts dying, because once you're touched, we're told, with that poison, you can count 30 minutes at most. The faster your heart's beating, the less time you have. So, the king says, part them, they are incensed. That is, it's no longer a game. It's no longer a simple fencing match. They're angry. Okay? And the queen falls. Osprey, look to the queen. Horatio, wait, they're bleeding. They shouldn't be bleeding. How is it, my lord? Osric asks, how is it, Laertes? Laertes, why as a woodcock to my own spring, Osric? Who used woodcocks in spring language earlier? Polonius in talking to Ophelia, in saying, Hamlet is merely trying to get you in bed. He's saying Hamlet's letters, his terms of love, they were woodcocks, that springs to catch woodcocks. Laertes is saying, what? Let me use speech that Hamlet uses to describe what's going to happen to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Tis the sport to have the engineer hoist with his own petard. Petard there means explosion. Engineer is a demolitions expert. You blow yourself up. Hamlet is saying, okay, or the play is saying, through Laertes, what? My plots, what? Have come back on myself. <clears throat> I am justly killed with mine own treachery. Justly. Why is it just? Because of the last word. He's saying, I was false. I was faithless to him. False and faithless how? I lied to him when I accepted everything that he said. All right? Hamlet, how's the queen? Notice, Hamlet's not swooning or anything yet. The king, oh, uh, she, she swoons to see them bleed. Oh, she's fainted because you're bleeding, Hamlet. All right? And the queen says, no, no, the drink. Oh, Hamlet, I'm poisoned. Oh, villainy, ho, let the door be locked. Treachery, seat it, close the door, nobody escapes. Treachery, seek it out. Seek it out means seek out the treachery. Where is the treachery? Hamlet's kind of saying, until I find the person who killed my mother, nobody leaves. Or another way of saying that is everybody either is going to die until I find out who killed my mother. So treachery, seek it out. Laertes, it's here, Hamlet. Hamlet, thou art slain. He's not dead yet, but no medicine in the world can do thee good, and thee there is not half an hour of life. The treacherous instrument's in thy hand, that is, you're still holding the foil. Unbaited and in venom, the foul practice hath turned itself on me. Lo, here I lie. Go back for just a second.
You know, the rough hewing, our ends, divinity shapes them. Okay, Laertes rough hewed his end how? He baited the foil, he put, pulled the tip off, but divinity shaped it by putting the foil in Hamlet's hand. He didn't expect that to happen. Okay, so he goes on. The foul practice hath turned itself on me. Lo, here I lie, never to rise again. Thy mother's poison, I can no more. I can no more means I can't do anything else. And I know no more other than colon. That is, I know no more than this. And what comes after is the this. The king, the king's to blame. Okay. Why? Who came up with the idea of the fencing match? Was it Laertes? Nope. It was the king. The king's plot is all of it. Okay. Hamlet. Oh, and the point is venom to, then venom to thy work. And he stabs Claudius. That's the first way Claudius will die. Not from the stab wound, but from the poison on the end of the tip. And everybody cries, treason! I mean, he's killing the king. That's treason, right? Oh, yet defend me, friends. I am but hurt. The king says, I'm not dead yet. Hamlet, really? <laughs> Here then. And he takes the goblet of wine and starts pouring it in his mouth. So he's going to die from the poison in the wound, and he's going to die from the poison that he's waterboarded with, essentially. Okay? Laertes, king dies. He is justly served. Line 300. <coughs> it is a poison tempered by himself. He mixed it. Exchange forgiveness with me, noble Hamlet. Noble. Mine and my father's death come not upon thee. So he says, exchange forgiveness with me, I forgive you. He's kind of hoping, will you forgive me? But then he says something else. Mine and my father's death come not upon thee. Why? It's part of the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Notice, forgive us, forgive me, for what I do, as, in the same manner as, I forgive others. So, if I don't forgive others, I don't get forgiven. He's saying, I forgive you, Hamlet. But he doesn't forgive Hamlet only for his own death. He forgives Hamlet for his father's death. He's saying, let that not be counted against you either. Wipe that clean. All right? nor thine, nor your death on me. Hamlet, heaven make thee free of it. Okay. God, don't hold this against Laertes. And in traditional Christian theology or the Christian tradition, guess what that means? It's done. It's forgotten. It's not held against them. Okay? So they both die forgiven. Notice, which is what Claudia, excuse me, what Hamlet Sr. didn't get. Now, Hamlet, when he sees Claudius praying, says, no, nah, might I do it, Pat? But, and he starts thinking, no, nah, it wouldn't be good. No, nah, I want to catch him in his bed or carousing. Well, he is carousing in a sense. He's drinking wine. He, he does catch him in his sin, right? Because what sin is Claudius caught in at this point? Poisoning. Murder. <laughs> and this is not just, you know, um, neglectful homicide. This, this is premeditated murder. You could call it neglectful homicide of Gertrude. He doesn't intend to kill Gertrude, but because he makes the poison, she drank it. He's the one at fault there. Whose death are Claudius really responsible for? Then, within this scene at least, Gertrude's, Hamlet's, and Laertes. Okay? 
okay? Because he's the one who put Laertes up to it. So, heaven make thee free of it. I follow thee. I am dead, Horatio. Wretched queen, adieu. You that look pale and tremble at this chance that are but mute your audience to act. Who's he talking to? You that look pale, that is, the blood is drained from their faces. They are in total shock. He says what? Had I but time, but I don't. I could tell you. He could tell them what? As Paul Harvey used to say, the rest of the story. What do they, all the people in the room, other than Hamlet and Horatio, not know? They don't know that Claudius killed Hamlet Sr. They don't know that Claudius poured poison in Hamlet Sr.'s ear. Hamlet say, is saying, I could tell you all that, but I don't have time. So what happens if Hamlet dies right now? Will the truth be known? No, it won't. Okay? So Horatio says... In response to Hamlet's, line 311, report me and my cause aright to the unsatisfied. Who are the unsatisfied? They're both the people in the room and the people outside the castle who are wondering, what's going on? What did Hamlet do? I heard Hamlet kill the king. I heard Hamlet kill Laertes. I heard Hamlet kill his mother. What happens if the truth isn't known? Then Hamlet dies, and his name is forever maligned and of bad repute. So Hamlet says to Horatio, report me and my cause are right. Horatio, nope, not gonna. I'm more an antique Roman than a Dane. That is, I'm more like an ancient Roman soldier who will die with his lord. I'm going to drink the poison too. So Hamlet grabs it and swallows it down. Says, nope. O oh God, Horatio 316. What a wounded name, things standing thus unknown, shall live behind me. If things stand as they are now, think what a horrible name I will have in the future. If thou didst ever hold me in thy heart, absent thee from felicity a while, that is, stay here on earth from felicity, that's heaven. Felicity, blessedness, happiness. Absent thee from happiness for a while. Live a little longer. For what purpose? And in this harsh world, draw thy breath in pain to tell my story. Go on, live, and tell everybody what? The real story. Tell everybody really why Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Tell everybody really why Polonius is dead. Tell them the whole truth. Because as of right now, what kind of truth do they have? 25% maybe? And a whole bunch of innuendo in hearsay. And here's a a marching noise, like trumpets and stuff from afar off. And Osric says it's Fortinbras, who comes from conquest in Poland. And to the ambassadors of England gives this warlike volley. The ambassadors from England? Ambassadors from England come back bringing what news? Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. And the tribute that the king commanded. So, Hamlet says, I die, Horatio, I cannot live to hear the news from England, but I do prophesy the election lights on Fortinbras. I prophesy Fortinbras will be elected king. Okay? And then he says, and he has my dying voice. I think he should be. Notice, by the way, if we go back to what we were talking about, that old Germanic fourfold ethic thing, um, you know, duty to kin, duty to lord, duty to avenge one's kin and lord. When he says, 
Fortinbras has my voice. What nice little symmetry do we end up with? Because what were we told at the beginning of the play? Why, why are the people, why are the soldiers standing on the battlements? Why are they protecting Elsinore? Well, because the king thinks Fortinbras is about to attack. Why would Fortinbras be about to attack? Because the previous king killed Fortinbras' father. Hamlet Sr. killed Fortinbras Sr. When did that happen? We find out in the grave during the scene that happened 30 years ago. Vengeance doesn't have to be immediate. In other words, you can take your time. My son every now and then, when he was much littler, my oldest son, he would do, you know, we we do things to each other. He'd do something to me and i go, you're going to get it. Payback will be sweet. And I'd say, but you don't know when it's happening. It might be today. It might be tomorrow. It might be next week. It might be in a couple of years. And he then, you know, he, is it coming, Dad? Is it coming? You know, kind of thing. That's the idea about this vengeance. So, what does Hamlet say here? The circle is complete, kind of. Okay? My father killed Fortinbras. Now Fortinbras is going to become king. Not only of Norway, where he already is king, he'll be king of Denmark, too. All right? And then he says, the rest is silence. And he dies. Now cracks a noble heart. Good night, sweet prince, and flights of angels sing thee to their rest. Okay? Fortinbras comes in, and he's like, what the hell is going on? Because you've got dead king, dead queen, dead Laertes, dead Hamlet. The royal family's gone. There's nobody else. Okay? So, Horatio kind of explains. Not much. He says, I can tell you, though, pick up with Horatio saying, give order that these bodies, line 349, that these bodies high on a stage be placed to the view. What do you mean to the view? If this were today, he'd be saying, order that these bodies be placed like in the Capitol Rotunda. Around in the south lawn of the White House, where there's always news crews. Why? So that whenever anybody turned on their TV, they would see this. They would see these bodies. Why? Because I'm going to give you the running commentary. And let me speak to the yet unknowing world. Everybody out there. How these things came about. That is, how these deaths happen. So shall you hear of carnal, bloody, and unnatural acts. Carnal, having to do with the flesh. Okay? Bloody, having to do with murder. Unnatural, having to do with, he's talking about unnatural sexual relations. Claudius Gertrude. But he's also talking about Husbands killing wives, husbands killing fathers, stepfathers killing nephews, slash stepsons, yeah, all kinds of problems. Of accidental judgments, what, give me an example of an accidental judgment. What a wreck! Is it the king? Damn, I took you for your better. Hamlet thought when he stabbed, Behind the heiress, it's the king. Notice, the play would have been done two acts earlier. But no, it's an accidental judgment. Casual slaughters. I could be wrong, but I think that personally involves Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Hamlet just kind of casually, metaphorically slit their throats. He didn't do it himself, but he was the cause of their death. The ultimate cause, Hamlet would argue, was the king. 
right? Casual slaughters of deaths put on by cunning and forced cause. Cunning, plot, forced cause, kind of in the heat of the moment. When Hamlet stabbed Laertes, when they scuffle, and Hamlet takes Laertes' foil, and Laertes gets Hamlet's foil, and Hamlet stabs them. Does, La does Hamlet mean to poison Laertes? No. He doesn't know the foil is poison. Hamlet's murder of Laertes is entirely accidental. Right? In fact, if anything, it's self-defense. Of death put on by cunning and forced cause, and in this upshot, purposes mistook, fallen on the inventor's heads. That's the engineers being hoist with their own petard. That's Larity saying, springs to catch woodcocks. I caught myself. That's Polonius being caught in his trap of his own cunning. Fortinbras, let us hear it. And then Fortinbras says, 368, bear Hamlet like a soldier to the stage. That is, men, put Hamlet up here on your shoulders. And walk in a procession, slowly, dignified. I kind of get the impression, the king, put him in a sack <laughs> and drag him. For he was likely, had he been put on, that is, had he been elected, to have proved most royal. Oh, he would have been a great king. And for his passage, the soldier's music and the rights of war speak loudly for him. Take up the bodies. That is Laertes, Claudius, and Gertrude. Cover those up. Such a sight as this becomes the field, the battlefield, not the heart of civilization. But here shows much amiss. Okay? So, you know, I suggested, ten minutes, I suggested that that line, the readiness is all, could be taken as the theme. Okay? Also consider, let me go back here for just a second. Because this is a nice segue to the Sophocles. When Hamlet says to Horatio, line 15, 320, 319, 318. Now, 319. When Hamlet says to Horatio, absent thee from felicity a while, and in this harsh world draw thy breath in pain to tell my story. He could be getting at another huge theme, and that's about the nature and quality of life in this world. He says, in this harsh world, draw thy breath in pain. Okay? If you have your books, turn to Sophocles, which is pages 1434 and 1435. We're going we're to start the introduction to Socrates in a moment. But, or put a finger there, and then open your book to 1484. Because I want to say something about the very ending of the play. Oedipus the King. Okay? So, Hamlet said... Absent thee from felicity a while, and in this harsh world draw thy breath in pain. Look at, on page 1484, the very last two lines of Oedipus the King. Now this is the chorus. Every time in an ancient Greek play, when a chorus comes out, the chorus comes out to kind of explain what you just saw, in case you didn't understand it. Okay? So they come out and they comment on it. 
This is the final chorus. It's the ending, the curtain draws after this. Okay? So they come out, and the chorus says, the last two lines, Now as we keep our watch and wait the final day. What's the final day? If it be not now, it be to come. It's death. Okay? So as we keep our watch, notice, as we do what we do, count no man happy till he dies, free of pain at last. Notice the similarity with that and with what Hamlet says. He says, absent thee from felicity a while, felicity, joy, blessedness, happiness, and do what? Draw thy sharp breath in this harsh world. Pain. Okay. Count no man happy till he dies, free of pain at last. Okay. Turn back to the beginning. I know we've only got like seven minutes left, but we can get some of it. Um, beginning of Sophocles. Pages 1436 through 30 through 41 give you the background of Greek drama, okay? And you've got several terms in bold print, okay? For the quiz that we probably will have, what's today? Today's Thursday? For the quiz that we'll probably have on Tuesday, those terms can show up. Okay, as well as on 1439, you've got the typical division of a Greek tragedy into five parts. Know those five parts. Okay? Prologue, Parados, Episodia, Stasimon, and Exodus. All right. So then on 1439, you've got an introduction kind of tragedy. And what Aristotle, because that's everything that's written about tragedy right here, um, 1439 to 1441, comes from Aristotle in a little book he wrote called On Poetics. Right? I think that might be mentioned somewhere. In there. And everything he wrote in On Poetics is largely about Greek tragedy, and it's largely based upon Oedipus which Aristotle took to be the greatest example of a tragedy, okay? So let's start Oedipus. You've got a list of, of dramatic characters, uh, the dramatis personae, or characters. Oedipus, king of Thebes. Creon, brother of Jocasta. Jocasta is his wife, so Creon is his step uh, brother in law right? You got Yocasta, the queen, wife of Oedipus, etc. So the play begins. Uh, should I go there? Yes, I should. We won't actually get into it because I need to mention this. In ancient Greek tragedy, according to Aristotle, you had what are called the three unities. Unity of time, place, and action. Or plot, if you want. Time. According to Aristotle, <coughs> a good tragedy should occur within a single 24-hour period. All right? It, it, just one day. All right? Place, there should be one location, one setting. That should not change. So, for example... In Oedipus the king, all the action of the play occurs in one day. It all occurs out in front of Oedipus' uh, hall, palace, whatever you want to call it. Okay? Plot, there should be a single plot. There's, there's one main course of action. Now, compare that for a moment with A Midsummer Night's Dream in Hamlet. No. They occur over several days, 
They occur in several locations. I mean, Hamlet, you're at Elsinore, you're at a room inside the castle, you're at another room inside the castle, you're at another room inside the castle, you're on the fields of Denmark, all right? It occurs all over the place. And you're at a burial spot for a minute. And then unity of plot. Shakespeare loves multiple plots. He loves little mini plots. So, for example, Midsummer Night's Dream, you've got the plot of Aegeus with his daughter. You've got the plot of Theseus and Hippolyta getting married. You've got the lovers. And then you've got uh, Oberon and Titania. I mean, you've got at least four plots there. But they're all tied together. Okay? Same kind of thing with Hamlet. So, for Thursday, we will, sorry, not Thursday, Tuesday, we will start Oedipus. Um, read the whole thing. Not great possibility, not great likelihood. But we might finish it in a day. Depends on how much I decide to skip. Uh, we'll de definitely get all of Oedipus done next week, all right? And I think we're probably going to go ahead and still do Antigone. Um, the exam's pushed way back, so don't worry about the exam. All right, we'll stop there. Have a good weekend.